do so. But what I'm most excited about is to bring you Moon to Mars and Artemis generation and this incredible excitement over what is not only the Perseverance rover mission, but also the ingenuity mission. To me, this is the little helicopter that can and will, and I cannot wait to celebrate uh, everything that is part of this engineering marvel. Joining me today is Josh Ravish. But before I get to uh, his impressive things that he's going to share with us as the mechanical engineer and the lead for JPL on this mission, I want to just say thank you to some very special sponsors that make sure that Explore Mars uh, gets to do and offer such great programming for all of you. Thank you. A big shout out to Aerojet Rocketdyne, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, ULA, and a very, very special, special uh, webinar sponsor. And thank you to the Rich Phillips Company. Again, all of those folks make it possible for us to bring you great programming. And especially in this year that is 2020, we certainly have enjoyed connecting with all of you and bringing you the kind of conversations that we want you to be talking about, having, and experiencing. And so Josh, without further ado, let's talk ingenuity. I told Josh that I made my own <laughs> little prototype, but I'm pretty sure this thing isn't going to fly. So fly tell it. me about your job at uh, JPL and all about the little helicopter that will. All right. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really excited to, to be a part of this. Um, certainly as an engineer, I'm not you know so used to being on a internet webcast, but uh, we'll, we'll do what we can. Um, yeah, so I was, I'm a mechanical engineer, uh, and I was on the mechanical engineering team um, for you know for the Ingenuity helicopter. Uh, it's actually quite a large team, but um, not the engineering team, but the entire I mean the entire project team, the mechanical engineering team. There's you know probably half dozen, two dozen of us uh, at JPL, as well as you know pockets uh, across um, NASA and in industry. Um, so my my job uh, was to help with. Uh, the mechanical design of a lot of the the JPL components, um, how you know, and then how does that fit together with the entire rotor assembly? How does that stow onto the rover? How does it deploy from the rover? You know, how can we survive a a, a rocket launch? Uh, as well, overseeing you know, through you know tons of testing, uh, integration to the rover, deployment from the rover, reintegration to the rover, um, just yeah, just just a lot of a lot of mechanical handling on the vehicle. The long process. Um, yeah, but you know, when I hear you talk about all of those things, it's anything that we're always talking about in any, any industry, right? It goes from, you know, kind of like brainstorm, idea, uh, you know, design, then a redesign, then test, prototype, more redesign. And then you, I mean, there's so many components that get to be figured out. I love this one comment that I have heard, um, and I believe it was Havard Grip, uh, who's Ingenuity's chief pilot at JPL, say that the Wright brothers showed that powered flight in Earth's atmosphere was possible using, you know, an experimental aircraft. But with Ingenuity, we're trying to do the same thing on Mars, correct? Yep. Uh, yeah, the, the project likes to call it the, you know, the, the Wright brothers moment. We hope we have one. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it would represent the first, yeah, the first uh, you know, powered aerial flight on someplace that's not Earth. So it would... Uh, <laughs> Be pretty great if, if it works you know no 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 promises we're all hopeful we did our you know we, we've done our best we think we you know we have a really great uh you know great vehicle ready to go but i mean long way from here to there so but i've heard, also heard mimi ong say that it's like it's it is one of these high risk high reward missions for nasa and uh you but you've been learning things all along the way talk us through from you know maybe those first some of those first design conversations how how did you come up with how much it should weigh and how the tripod or how fast i mean it's even to me amazing how fast those uh rotor blades are going to go yeah um yeah so uh it is a tech demo uh, tech demonstration mission so a technology demonstration mission so it's it is intended to be kind of lower cost higher risk um mission there's not really a science 
there's not really a science goal on it. There's engineering goals that we, you know, we want to demonstrate. And so because of that, you know, that higher, higher risk that we've taken, you know, we're able to keep things smaller. We're using some technologies that we normally wouldn't use on, you know, like the Perseverance rover, you need that thing to be as golden as possible. It's got to work. Uh, so there's a lot of a, a lot of work and time that goes into verifying it, you know, making sure the reliability is good and, you know, give us a lot of confidence that it'll be able to handle anything that happens. Helicopter. Yeah, we've learned a lot. We spent a lot of time engineering it since the original concepts were actually, I think, in the late 90s, which I was in. I was in school. I was in high school at that time. So and if, I'm, if I'm mentioning this correctly, it was called Marv. Is that true? It was something... uh, you, you might know more than I do about this. Uh, and I, I did a bit of reading and it's like this original concept and I can't remember exactly what the acronym stood for, but it was this Martian aerial something vehicle, roving vehicle or, or rotor vehicle. That was, it was Martian aerial uh, rotor vehicle and it was a concept and so it appears so if anybody's out there and you had a great idea, you know, 20, 25 years ago, don't throw away that paper. It could become good science someday. But to me, this is, this is the most profound thing that we're always scaffolding. We're always building and standing on the shoulders of those thoughts and, and, you know, kind of like thoughts and giants of, you know, engineering that come before. So take us through. So you had like a little bit of an idea and a prototype, but again, that's late 90s stuff. What's that like sitting down as you are the lead mechanical engineer? Hey guys, we're going to make a helicopter. <laughs> so, uh, um, I don't know if you've talked to our chief engineer before, uh, Bob, he's kind of the, the mastermind behind this project and uh, him and Mimi kind of, you know, shepherded the, the entire, you know, nationwide team um, to do this. It's, it's, uh, it was quite an adventure. Uh, before I got on the job, I, I joined the team in late 2016. They had done a tiny little, a tiny little vehicle about hand sized, um, just to demonstrate that you could fly in a vacuum at all. Uh, they put it in a, in a you know, vacuum chamber, turn it on, kind of hops around. I actually have a video that I could show when we get to that point, if you'd like to see of, of a few of these. Uh, demonstrated that worked great. Um, so from there, well, you know, next step, can you control it uh, at all? I mean, you know, this thing just kind of bounces around. But uh, so they built a full size mock up uh, that was just basically a rotor system with a power cable <laughs> attached to it. Flew that in a vacuum chamber. Uh, all the control came from, you know, from off board from computers. Um, and that worked too. That was in about uh, mid 2016. Uh, at that point, we're like, oh, wow, we can actually control a vehicle, you know, a, a helicopter in a Martian environment at, in the Martian um, you know, atmosphere. So the vacuum chamber pumped down to, you know, Martian atmosphere and filled with, you know, similar, uh, similar gases. Um, so it, you know, performs kind of like Mars, we hope anyways, <laughs> you never know until you're there. Um, True, but it's like, to me, it's like, so we've talked about the Martian atmosphere, we're talking 95% you know, carbon dioxide, maybe, maybe truly 1% of the earth's atmosphere. When did you guys realize that you're going to have to make those rotor blades go five to six times faster than any helicopter you'd ever fly here on earth? I think I'm pretty sure that the, you know, the early concepts uh, realized that, I mean, they knew, they, they knew that the, uh, you know, atmosphere is so low, right? Like you said, 1% of here, it's equivalent of around like hundred thousand feet on, on earth to put it into perspective. So, you know, three times higher than you'd fly in a, you know, in a, in a commercial airliner. Um, so, so they knew, and that's as actually one of the biggest uh, problems on this was, you know, low atmosphere, um, you need a lot of lift. So yeah, giant blades, the picture of it, um, you know, I'll show a picture hopefully. Uh, yeah, the, the picture of it, you see the blades are disproportionately sized relative to the, yeah, to the helicopter and that's to get as much lift as possible. We also had to fight mass. Um, the gravity is only a, only a third of earth, but because the atmosphere is one hundredth of earth, you really need to cut down as much mass as possible to keep up your, you know, your lift and be able to overcome your own weight. Uh, and that was really the problem that we ran into in late 2016 when I joined, joined the, the job, uh, the mechanical engineering team, we were given the task of, okay, we've shown that this rotor system can be controlled in, in a Martian environment, but now you have to take everything on it that has to go to Mars with it. So all the electronics, all the batteries, by the way, batteries are pretty heavy. <laughs> um, uh, solar panel to, to recharge it, uh, get power, um, you know, all the things that it needs to be able to survive launch, to be able to, you know, on a rocket is, is uh, 
far as I know, it's not very common to launch helicopters on rockets, especially off the planet. So that was another challenge um, as well to survive the night. You know, Earth is mostly pretty balmy, but Mars at nighttime can get down to in the you know, minus 90 Celsius range. Um, so very cold, you know, colder than most most of our you know, uh, components are really supposed to work at. And that's one of the things that I read, that that is actually one of the greatest power drains on the helicopter is surviving a Martian night. You're, you're absolutely correct. Uh, our flights are roughly 90 seconds is the, the planned flight time, uh, somewhere in that range. But the majority of the battery power uh, held on the helicopter in a given day is used to just stay warm, survive the night. During the daytime, gets up to, you know, sometimes normal, normal-ish temperatures, like around freezing temperature on Earth <laughs> is, is like a warm day on Mars. But yeah, the, that nighttime uh, really, you know, really is a, a yeah, it really was a challenge. And that, that was the, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 you keep going. Yeah, so, uh, and keeping the mass down, right? I mean, there's lots of insulations we have. I mean, you think on earth, oh yeah, you insulate your house. And we looked at that. We actually had looked at one point at aerogel, if you've ever heard of that, that's that really super thin 99.9% .9 air material, but that 0.1% not air was uh, still too heavy for us. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, engineering problems here. The other question that's coming in, I think, from the audience is, did your testing ever involve any kind of like Martian wind or Martian dust storms? Yes, uh, wind can get pretty high. Luckily, it, uh, because the, the air density is low, it doesn't blow you as hard as a uh, Sorry for the background. It's actually an Earth helicopter <laughs> flying over my house, um, if you could hear it. Uh, yeah, so we actually spent uh, with one of our engineering models. We built a, a few engineering models in the 2017-2018 time frame, and um, we built a giant wind wall in this vacuum chamber. The chamber is about 15 feet tall, I think, something like that, and had a ton of fans on it uh, to blow to blow air at the helicopter. So yeah, they spent the yeah you know, the team the test team spent a few months up there playing around with that and trying to be able to control in the you know expected wind speeds. And I would just expect it would be like any any particular aircraft. You would look at Martian weather, wind conditions, and that sort of thing as to when you will fly. Do you want to show some of your pictures or slides or videos? Because to me, it's also you're going to have to explain to everybody how, like, because communication time between Earth and Mars takes a while, the rovers actually coded to tell Ingenuity what to do. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, lag time is around seven minutes. Uh, if you might remember from the Curiosity mission, seven minutes of terror. Um, yeah, so we've got seven minute lag. So there's not a person on the ground who's able to fly it, um, right? You, you can't joystick it because the missions, you know, the, the flight is over before you know, you've even told it to go at that point. So uh, yeah, and uh, even that, it's actually very difficult. What they found out in the original, I think 2014, the little tiny vehicle was that uh, because the air is so thin, a helicopter actually flies differently than a normal helicopter. So you control it to go one direction, it doesn't necessarily go that direction. So it's, it's mostly impossible to fly without computer. Um, so uh, the, the way the mission works, yeah, we, we give a, a flight plan to the helicopter. And of course, as you said, check the weather first with uh, the, the Perseverance team. Um, <laughs> assuming we're all good, we're all good on weather and temperature and other, you know, environmental conditions. Yeah, send the, send the command to the rover. The rover sends the command to the helicopter over an antenna um, and says, you know, here's your flight plan. Then helicopter figures out the rest. Again, I'm astounded because there are times that, that my Wi-Fi is supposed to work as easily as that and it goes down. Is there, is there a distance that that helicopter has to stay, you know, in, in, within, I guess, a distance within that it has to stay close to the Perseverance rover? I mean, you guys, are, I know you're planning, what, five missions within those first 30 days if it all goes well? Yep, if all goes well, up to five, up to five flights. Um, so somewhere in between one and five, we hope. Uh, and yeah, line of sight to the antenna is is a consideration as well as distance. We're, we'll stay within a couple hundred meters of uh, you know Perseverance rover, something in that range. Um, uh, we don't want to get too close to to them. Right. Of course, uh, they're they're not too keen on uh, <laughs> having a helicopter fly around there. <laughs> they're a very nice rover. Um, <laughs> 
It's like I can hear perseverance saying, okay, it's okay, ingenuity, if you crash and burn, but I got a job to do and I'm here. You know what I mean? So it's like, keep your distance there. But it's a little bit like social distancing here on earth. It's like, it's going to back away. Why don't you share some of your pictures and your slides? Because to me, when I see it visually, again, I think everybody's going to even appreciate um, the genius that is your engineering. I mean, it is really a marvel and it's going to add an entirely new dimension of exploration once this works. And uh, I'm, I'm betting on you guys that it's gonna go really well. Well, thank you, thank you. Here, let's, uh, yeah, I'll, hopefully this will work. All right, uh, is this showing up on your screen? Perfect, and all you gotta do is just go into presentation mode. Great. Um, so, yep, here's a, this is an early artist conception. The real one doesn't look like this anymore. However, we do have some early uh, non-functional models uh, floating around that still look like the helicopter. The, the, main, the main premise uh, and design architecture is the same, legs, uh, the electronics box on the bottom, uh, coaxial rotors. Um, a question we normally get actually on the co- coaxial rotors is, well, why did you choose that versus, you know, the more common, you know, multi-copter design you'd see for an Earth-based drone? And there's some minor differences in performance, but actually the real reason was that in the early days when, you know, we were starting the design of this, uh, we, we thought it was actually easier, it was going to be easier to, to stow this on the, on the Perseverance rover in the, if it was coaxial versus being a, a wider a wider body. As it turns out, we ended up uh, going to the bottom of the, of the, the rover. So we, we might have been able to make the other one work. But at, at the time uh, in 2016 era, we were mounted elsewhere on the rover. And this looked like the best option for us. Um, so yeah, as we said, uh, yeah, technology demonstration, first rotorcraft flight at Mars and uh, anywhere uh, not on Earth. So. <laughs> extremely excited for that um you know team the team's just you know it, it was it was a definitely a hard development uh schedule for the team you know everyone was you know really working hard but it's just such an honor to be able to work on something like this it's, it's genuinely once in a lifetime opportunity um so here's a you know, quick little video hopefully the sound comes through all right um just to show kind of an artist concept of uh you know of the mission this actually does look very close to the, the flight uh, helicopter. So uh, yeah, basic uh, idea, rover drops us off on the surface, drives away. Uh, after our checkouts are done, helicopter flies to missions. And actually a video in a, in a uh, minute that has the uh, some of the videos from the chamber you can hear the blade sound you can actually hear it and uh it's quite possible i think perseverance has a microphone so it's quite possible you'll be able to hear uh, no promises but you might be able to actually hear the helicopter on mars oh that is super cool and that actually goes to a question we've got from dallas beinhoff he what sensors are on ingenuity so so a camera the ingenuity doesn't have the microphone. The microphone's on perseverance. Does it have a thermometer? Uh, it does not have a thermometer, but uh, that is a great question. There's very little that's non-essential for function. Uh, for function, we have a, a rangefinder, like an altimeter, to tell how high we are. We have a accelerometer, gyroscope package to tell where we, you know, where we are and try to figure out, you know, our position. As well, we have a black and white camera for uh, navigation that faces down. Um, it has a the only thing that's uh, not essential for flight. We have one color camera uh, that's um, intended only to take pictures and send them back to Earth. Uh, it's aimed more, the, the, the black and white camera is kind of aimed down. You can't really see it in this picture, but you can see the little notch on the, on the right side of the bottom box. That's the, the color camera. It aims out at, you know, uh, an angle that we hope will give us okay pictures. Um, yeah, and that's about it. It's actually pretty simple otherwise. You know, we didn't have a lot of mass. As a technology demonstration, we just wanted to prove this works, right? We don't want to do anything else that we, you know, don't need to do. Uh, we don't have the mass uh, to be able to, to carry, you know, extra stuff on this vehicle. Um, total mass for this uh, is about 1.8 kilograms, about four pounds. 
So, you know, less than a two liter bottle of soda, the project <laughs> manager gets annoyed when I describe it that way, but it's really easy for people to conceptualize. So, well, you know what, I love that stuff because then it's like something applicable and go, oh, all right, it's like less than that. A couple of questions are coming in. Uh, Bob Terry wants to know why not a balloon or blimp rather than the helicopter? Uh, so definitely looked at that. I'm sure people are still looking at that. Uh, I, I like blimps too. I'm a big fan. So uh, hopefully that's in the future too. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, difficulties in everything. Um, you know, especially inflatables, you know, are difficult to, to, you know, bring out there uh, for the original, I think the MER, the, the Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit Opportunity, you know, even the airbag system was, you know, quite a challenge. So, uh, you know, there, there are challenges in everything. Um, you know, so I, I'm not saying that, you know, this precludes doing, uh, you know, airships. Uh, that's very, very likely in the future for, you know, Mars as well as other, uh, other bodies, Titan, Venus, any other atmospheric body. Um, but I guess, uh, yeah, this time, you know, we have a helicopter. It's also got a lot of uh, benefits. You know, helicopter is very, uh, uh, very uh, responsive fast you can kind of go where you want and kind of change on the fly it doesn't you know the airship you know might be a little bit slower um so i, I guess you can argue the merits of both uh my personal opinion i'd love to do all of it uh so hopefully that's still in the future for everyone penny boston wants to know how much concern is the dust environment um in, of the air on mars for ingenuity's performance so we actually spent a lot of time looking at that uh we've done uh a lot, a lot of testing with uh, simulants of the, the Martian, uh, Martian soil and the Martian dust. We've did uh, simulations of, you know, how we expect uh, the dust to recirculate. Um, we think it's going to be okay. We don't, we don't think it'll be a problem. Um, you know, we looked at things like, well, how do you keep the dust out of our, out of our rotors? Is that going to be a problem if it gets in there you know, as things are spinning around? Uh, that doesn't seem to be too big of a deal. Uh, solar panel, um, you know, obviously you might remember from Spirit Opportunity, you know, there's questions about, well, you know, dust gets on the solar panels. Um, you know, we, we, we knew, you know, what they've experienced. And so we were able to take that into account when we're, you know, deciding how to design and size our, our own solar panels. So, I mean, yeah, we, we, we think we're, we think we've, we've done everything we can to, you know, try to survive the dust environment. And, and we think we'll be able to. Uh, Dennis Dubé once he assumes the blades are counter rotating. Yes. Yep. They are uh, counter rotating to, you know, cancel out the, the, the momentum. Um, Right versus a normal Earth helicopter, where you'd have you know the tail, uh, the tail rotor that does the same thing. Um, yep, and uh, yeah, like I said, coaxial blades, you know, were chosen mostly for uh, packing onto Perseverance. Um, but yeah, there's some some benefits to that. There's some other Earth uh, Earth helicopters that use coaxial blades too. I think both uh, you know American, some other countries have uh, developed you know regular passenger helicopters like that as well. And then Alan Solaris says, if the helicopter were to tip over or tips over, maybe crash landed or, you know, just something vibrates and gets dizzy, could it be righted? Can you tip it back up or is that mission over at that moment? Um, we have not planned for that. I mean, we certainly discussed it, but we don't have any, yeah, any plans to be able to recover from that. And we've never tried it out. You know, can we get ourselves up? I'm sure you could turn the blades on, but, uh, I'm not, I don't think you'd be able to, to write itself. I think you send perseverance over there. You, you, kind of go, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that give, might be give your friend a little push up. <laughs> I mean, anything's possible. I'm never going to say, say nothing. You know, nothing's impossible. Right. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> One never knows. It's like, I am so impressed by engineers and the way that you guys conceive mathematically and all of the mechanisms that are there. So if any of you engineers are out there or future engineers, just know that how much fun do you think that would be to like practice and get to do these things. We have another question coming in. It says, uh, did you say there'll be uh, five or so flights in the first week? What happens after the first five? Uh, will you still continue if successful on those first five missions? Will it be kind of like a spirit and opportunity? Hey, we were only supposed to last for 90 days and look, 10, 12 years later, we're still here. What do you think? So uh, it's 30 days actually for the first mission and it's up to five flights. So uh, at you know, hopefully it'll be somewhere uh, between one and five, you know, 
maybe three. Uh, beyond that, we, we don't really have plans. Uh, that answer to that question is probably above, uh, you know, well above my head. It's uh, more of a, you know, NASA uh, headquarters program level decision um, what to do you know the rover the perseverance mission has a lot of other things planned and so you know we're you know we did our thing we'll you know we'll finish our 30-day mission uh, there's nothing that, uh, the only thing I say there's nothing necessarily limiting the life of uh, ingenuity um, you know towards winter it might not be able to you know survive the, the cold um, and be able to fly but uh, there's not, there's still nothing limiting and, um, you know, uh, extending, extending the mission, but we plan for our 30 days and, you know, that's it. Uh, whatever happens beyond that. Uh, yeah. You <laughs> have to ask somebody more powerful than me. <laughs> we'll have to start a petition. Ingenuity, keep on going. Uh, now, Brian Harvey, what is Ingenuity looking for? Or what are, like, is your team, what is its, its big number one mission goal? So, Actually, really just learning what it takes to fly on Mars is is the primary goal. This is to demonstrate the technology works. Uh, even, you know, I mean, even uh, just one flight of up and hover will learn so much about, you know, about the environment. Even just sitting on the surface will learn so much about thermal control. Can we stay warm? How do we stay warm? Did what we do work? Um, even what we've done so far, how do you package a helicopter with, you know, a lot of very uh, different uh, types of technology than we normally use to, to survive space flight to another planet. So all, all that stuff will feed into, you know, the potential next mission, you know, if there's another helicopter, uh, include payloads on it. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of potential feature applications. Um, there's scouting for Rover. Um, there's scouting for, you know, possible manned exploration on Mars in the future. Um, there's remote uh, sample acquisition. Um, you can fly somewhere you can't fly or you can't go to with a rover or even a human down into a ravine up a mountain. Um, you can, you know, get visual, uh, you know, a bird's eye view from, you know, the 10 to, you know, 30 meter height uh, range, you know, kind of up there where right now we see the surface and we can see from way up in space from, you know, like Mars, uh, you know, uh, MRO, you know, some of the other Mars uh, satellites. Um, you can also perhaps even go to sensitive areas where you don't even want to touch the surface and fly over them and take a picture. Uh, so, so much possibility. I, if you, I know you've got other things to show us. Bear with me just a few more moments. I want to ask you a few more questions if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, um, so, Alan brings up a great idea. It's kind of like one friend, one rover helps its helicopter friend or, fr or helicopter friend helps his uh, friend the rover. Could the air of movement from the blades of ingenuity be used to clean off the solar panels on the rover? So, uh, so this rover is uh, powered with RTG, not with uh, so solar panels, but uh, that is a great idea, and a few folks have suggested using the the downwash to <laughs> see what it does and see see if it can blow dust around. So in the future, that could totally be possible. Uh, yeah, who knows? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll you know certainly after you know the first spin up of the blades, we'll see how much dust moves off the surface, and I yeah, think a. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find some cool applications. Uh, somebody once said to me that, you know, possibly the best applications for this haven't even been thought of yet. So, you know, you might be uh, thinking of them right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. It becomes like the, uh, d the dust uh, or the Swiffer for perseverance. So uh, not to diminish its amazingness, ingenuity, I meant no harm. So uh, Tapa Swinney has a question. What are the key aspects of ingenuity that is makes it strong enough to survive the seven minutes of terror, but light enough to fly on Mars. That is a great question. Um, I've actually discussed this, so I will skip to this one. So, what's in it? Um, we used a lot of a lot of carbon fiber and uh, custom composite layups, and that really helps you keep that really lightweight while still becoming you know strong and, and stiff as well as a big challenge you can see the blades are fairly long relative to and this is this is an older version of it that we've just been using this graphic for a long time um, but yeah the, the blades are extremely long so how do you keep the blades from flexing too much or breaking over such a you know long distance and that really comes from the you know the the advancements in the you know the blade material design uh, same the solar panels made from that material um, 
the elect well the batteries and the electronics are actually some of the stronger components in in this uh, vehicle uh, but even surrounding that like i said we don't have insulation we actually just use the atmosphere itself uh you know the martian atmosphere uh, trapped within uh you know it's kind of like when you put on your winter coat and the air gets trapped in um yeah just to you know just to stay warm and uh, limit our, our heat loss so uh yeah that's really it we we applied a lot of our standard you know flight uh, practices and workmanship practices for building hardware so you know we built it as good as as we can but yeah it's really the you know trying to use new uh, new items, stronger items, smaller items than we than we normally do. And it is you use some kind of carbon fiber for the blades is what Jim wants to know. Yes. Uh, yeah, I can't tell you which uh, <laughs> what carbon fiber we used or what specifically is inside them. But yeah, it is, it's a carbon fiber layup. And so uh, Paul is asking, how does it achieve tilt? Can it, uh, can it yaw by varying rotor speed? Uh, but how does it tilt? Yes, actually, uh, there is cyclic and collective on both of the both of the blades, um, so it can do. Uh, so collective is up and down, so that's you pitch both blades at the same time, and then uh, cyclic is you know side to side. So you know you, you change the. It has a mechanism called a swash plate that is on you know every helicopter, and uh, the way they move up the you know move the swash plate, you can kind of change the the uh, relative lift on a, you know sides of the vehicle as it as the blades spin around and that pushes you one way or the other uh, it's, it's actually it's so very you know very much the same control as we use on you know earthbound helicopters brilliant uh and then uh let's see what major changes had to be made to the blades to accommodate uh the much less dense atmosphere mars was it shape length width all, all of the above um yeah, all of the above. The uh, the blades have to be, uh, you know, like really lo really long. Um, and nor normally on Earth, there there's uh, some differences in blades. You'll see blades will be kind of long and thin. Some of the reason for that is the way the blades interact with the with the atmosphere on Earth. The air actually keeps the blades from you know flapping out of control. Uh, it doesn't work the same way on Mars because it's so uh, you know such low density. So yeah, just making the blades as as stiff and strong as possible to keep the you know the lifting surfaces uh, from breaking apart was that uh, yeah, was uh, was the challenge there and then that goes to another question top of swinney had is that as it's exiting its little compartment and perseverance is uh reversing and moving backwards is there any chances there could be a little ding in a blade or any damage to uh the blade at all that would affect its ability to fly or be controllable? Uh, so, so first actually direction of travel, it, uh, it might not be backwards, it might be forwards. Uh, that's I'm sure still up in the air. So, but uh, as far as that, there's been a lot of work on both teams to make sure that, you know, when we deploy and we've done deployment tests actually from the Rover that when we drop, we're nowhere near their, their wheels. Um, besides, you know, us being, you know, relative uh, empty soda can to the, the <laughs> perseverance, uh, you know, for us to, you know, get bound up in the wheels would be a serious, uh, you know, problem too. Uh, you know, we don't want to uh, affect their mission at all. So we don't expect that there will be any damage, at least between the interaction between the two vehicles. Of course, uh, you know, during landing, we learned on uh, Curiosity, a lot of stuff gets kicked up, a lot of rocks get kicked up. Uh, we actually have a, uh, the uh, Perseverance has a, a giant uh, debris shield, um, a kind of a black, thick carbon fiber debris shield to protect us from, from impacts. Uh, it's always possible that you know, something gets through, it's always possible that who knows, you know, uh, debris falls off of uh, something, falls from the sky, whatever it happens to be and, and hits us. Uh, I can't really say how, how much damage the blades can sustain and still work. It really just depends, you know, where and, and how it's, uh, you know, how it's damaged. Well, I will let you continue with the other things that you have there and we'll wait for some more questions to come in. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, as we uh, said before, the you know, first first trick was, uh, can you even lift? Uh, and for, for a long time, a lot of people, I think, and around the world, you know, were dubious that it was possible. But uh, in 2014, uh, they built a little, the little uh, model here. And see, so kind of just hop up and down. Uh, I'll let the, uh, the video run because it's actually in the end of it is uh, 
and see what happens. Uh, here, this actually is a very experienced drone pilot trying to fly the helicopter, and you can see the trouble they're having doing that. And you can, uh, you'll see in a second <laughs> what, uh, what eventually happens. Let's see, yeah, there we go. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> oh no! So uh, that's that's the uh, demonstrates the difficulty of trying to fly by <laughs> my hand. So it doesn't have four prongs on the bottom, or is it just three? That one might have had three. I think that one might have had three on it. Uh, the um, no, maybe it was four. No, it must have been four. Uh, yeah, I forget. I haven't seen it. We, we uh, it's in our it's in our helicopter lab still. I just haven't looked at it and you know since we've been home really for the past nine months so i forget <laughs> exactly i'm pretty sure it's four though uh, so yeah next uh yeah i mentioned how do you fly in you know or can you fly a full-scale model with control um as you can see the wires coming out the bottom so on, on board of this is just legs uh the the blades uh motors um I think just uh, a few motor electronics, but all the control, all the powers is, is coming in from outside. And so that happened in the middle of 2016. And I think it's the first time you really hear what it's gonna sound like. Um, just to warn you, I might not be able to hear you when the blades really start going if it's loud enough. So uh, <laughs> that is the sound that it will sound like on Mars. This is at Mars, uh, Mars density. And the little balls on the top are actually a Vicon motion capture system, kind of like the people who do the, you know, uh, movies, uh, you know, like CGI for movies use uh, when you wear the suits with the little balls on them. And this is just for the cameras around the chamber to track the vehicle so we know where it is. So let's skip to the next one. It's looks like that for the next 20 seconds. And there's uh, other flight videos too that are probably as interesting. Um, so after that, yeah, went to the engineering model, right? How do you package everything you need to take, which again, the electronics, the batteries are quite a sizable mass in, in the vehicle. So, uh, you know, it really eats into the, you know, uh, your, your lift margin. Um, so this is a engineering model. Actually, you'll notice that it looks fairly similar uh, to the, the flight helicopter. The blades are the same, the, um, the solar panel looks the same, the basic location of the electronics and most of the electronics are the same. The, le the legs look a little different. Uh, the feet change shape uh, after some tests that were done to try to figure out you know, what the best uh, foot shape would be for getting into the sand without getting too you know, caught up in the sand. Um, and uh, these uh, you know, legs uh, are slightly different too in that they don't stow. Whereas the, the ones that actually go on perseverance have to stow, so you know you don't have to have these giant legs splayed out while the rover is uh, flying through space. Um, so we we did uh, successive testing with this, uh, some static testing to try to figure out the vehicle dynamics. We did uh, uh, testing on a big swing arm, and this is all in our uh, 25 foot diameter, 80 ish foot tall vacuum chamber that we test most of our large spacecraft in uh, at JPL. And uh, I think we. Yeah, we, we spent a, a long time in this chamber doing lots of testing. And then that uh, culminated in the engineering model with the first free flight test with uh, everything, you know, kind of Mars-like in it. And you can see at the top of it, um, there's a cable coming off the top. And again, excuse, uh, excuse me if you can't hear because uh, of the, the sounds. Um, there's a cable coming off the top. That's actually a gravity offload. Uh, because uh, this helicopter is designed to lift in Mars gravity of, uh, you know, which is one third of Earth. This, this tether is actually uh, attached to uh, a mechanism that's pulling the helicopter up at two thirds the, the um, you know, two thirds the weight of the helicopter. So a helicopter is about four pounds. It's pulling up at, you know, whatever, you know, two thirds of that. It's like, you know, two and a half, three pounds upwards. And if you you know, if you stop flying the blades, if you stop spinning the blades, the helicopter would fall down because that can't actually hold it up. And to demonstrate that it's not actually providing stability for this, you can see that as the helicopter is is moving and translating to the side, is actually pulling the cable sideways, trying to fight against it. I mean, astounding! Just bravo! Of bravo. 2018.
Yeah, it was a, uh, it was quite, it was quite a, a, a day for the team. Everyone was there uh, at the chamber watching the video, and you know we didn't know what was going to happen, right? This is the first time we're trying that that vehicle out in free flight, and uh, it's definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely a momentous occasion for us. Um, so yeah, after that uh, that success, we went ahead with the build of the flight uh, flight helicopter. Yeah, this is it. Um, See. And you did go from kind of like the round kind of uh, mechanisms on the ends of the foot pads to a more angular kind of foot pad thing there. Yep. Yep. And that was uh, just, uh, you know, based on, you know, development of trying to, you know, figure out what the best shape would be to, you know, to land and successfully be able to take off from the, you know, the Martian soil. A couple of, One of them that's... Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, yeah. The, the hook is uh, for the rover. These... Uh, these legs hinge up and then they get grabbed by the by Perseverance rover to you know to hold them in place and that's just part of part of that. Again, um, the thought process of how every bit and piece works together within the whole is stunning. A couple of questions that have come in: What was what would you say as a member of the team was the biggest challenge, and what did you guys do to overcome that? Was there ever a moment? when you guys left work that day going, I don't think this is able guys, or was there ever like that moment where it seemed insurmountable? So our, our chief engineer would say there was probably one of those every week. <laughs> uh, but the, the, the underlying problem for this whole mission was, was the mass. It's just how to keep the mass down. I mean, and everything else just fed into that, um, you know, mass versus the ability to store energy by having more batteries, being able to capture more energy with a larger solar panel, um, being able to survive, you know, on the rocket without being too light, um, being able to carry enough, uh, you know, accommodation to keep us warm with insulation. So uh, even just performance, right, how much electronics you can shove in here to do what you want, uh, you know, comes into you know, that, that mass equation. So that, that was that was the gremlin that we were chasing the entire time. And, you know, 1.8, we were, yeah, that was, you know, we were right, right there on uh, near our allocation. So uh, we, we did what we could to get it under there. And we're, you know, <laughs> very, uh, I, I don't know, I don't want to say lucky, but we worked hard at it. But uh, we were, it was fortuitous that we <laughs> were able to pull it off. No, I, again, I think anybody listening and asking these questions of you is just, again, we are looking at some real engineering um a real marvel and the fact that it will be the first aerial kind of dimension that gets added to space exploration. I do believe your team is correct in calling it the Wright Brothers moment. I cannot wait to watch this and kind of just cry along with the team as you guys succeed. Is there anything else that you want to show us here in your slides? Uh yeah, there's a few uh, few other pictures of, of interest. Uh, yeah, after flight helicopter was checked out, we yeah, joined up with the rover, uh, ran through testing with them, deployed fully uh, autonomously through the rover commands. Um, this is you know us landing below them. You can kind of see us tucked away under there. So that's you know roughly where we're going to be under the rover um, on Mars. Uh, then uh, after that, back on the rover, ready uh, yeah ready for flight, and you know launched. Um, you know, launched this past July and we're, we're just on the way there. Uh, if you're curious how it's doing so far, we don't actually have to do too much with the helicopter during, uh, during the cruise phase of the mission. It's mostly every so often we just have to, you know, uh, charge our battery up, you know, just like you got to plug your cell phone in every so often. Um, as well, we've got uh, heaters, heaters on there to make sure we don't get too cold that are run by the rover. Um, and that's, yeah, that's mostly it until we get to the surface. Um, probably in the first couple months, you know, once, once the rover lands, uh, Perseverance has to do all of its checkouts and, you know, start its mission. And then once they're ready to go, um, you know, helicopter mission uh, will come up. And yeah, once they deploy us, you know, like I said, roughly in the first couple months, and then we've got our 30 days. And there's some, uh, you know, we talked about it before, things we can learn from that thermal survival. Can we, can we, sur can we survive? Did we do it right? What can that, you know, what can we do better in the future? Uh, can we charge, uh, you know, properly? Is the solar panel gonna work? Can it handle the dust? Did it survive the launch and flight too? Uh, even communication, um, <clears throat> this might be the, I, I imagine this is the first time that any two vehicles on the surface of Mars have communicated to each other. Um, 
Yeah, uh, so that, that'll be a new uh, adventure too. As well, just even the checkouts, even before flight, everything we do, we'll do some spinning on the ground. You know, uh, we'll learn a lot from that. Uh, how, is the, how are the blades reacting? How is the vehicle reacting? Yeah, how, what, what does the dust do? All, all this stuff to learn. And then of course, yeah, up to five flights. And the flights are, you know, increasing complexity. If we make the five flights, you know, the first one maybe up, come down, second one, maybe up, move a little, come back, uh, you know, leading up to, you know, flying a long distance, taking pictures of something, and then maybe even, you know, leaving our current site and flying off to a new base site. This is exciting. <laughs> right brother's moment. That's a... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just, again, it does sound a little bit like a James Bond movie though, because it's like, or a James Bond maneuver. It's like the spring loaded arm. It's going to flip the four pound ingenuity out of a compartment beneath the Rover's debris shield. I mean, again, that just, who doesn't want to work on that? <laughs> it's like, you know, I just is amazing. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, uh, genuinely lucky to, to be allowed the opportunity to work on something like this. Yeah, I never would have imagined it, you know, if you told me this, even, you know, even while I'm working at JPL that I'd be able to work on something like this. But certainly if you ever talked to me beforehand, I, I mean, who, who could have ever conceived that, you know, you'd get this opportunity. I'm sure most of the team feels, you know, absolutely the same way about that. Um, yeah, so it's just a summary of timeline we went over. Uh, so yeah, we're looking April, May for the, the actual first flight on Mars. Uh, team, uh, is, teams, teams are large, right? It's, uh, you know, besides NASA, NASA JPL, a lot of other, uh, um, a lot of other both in NASA and out of NASA partners. I mean, this list is too long to go on. And, and you know, besides companies, uh, uh, academic institutions contributed. It's, you know, it's just it's just a lot uh, of people. And say, you know, the same is true. I think of you know any mission, right? It's if you count up however many people worked on it. You know, there might be like you know what you'd think of as maybe the core team, but the amount of people who touch it. I mean, helicopter could be you know still something this small, in, I'm sure in the thousands of people who have you know had a hand in it. Uh, this is just a part of the local team, um, wow. JPL and regional uh, area. And this is by no means inclusive of even the people at JPL or the other regional companies who contributed. Uh, and like I said, you know, across the country, you know, it's, I'm sure many times more than this. So we talked before, we had some various, uh, um, you know, potential future uh, you know, applications, right? You know, fleets of drones flying all over the place, going to places you can't go otherwise, scouting for, uh, you know, rovers, scouting for, you know, uh, human exploration. So, uh, a, lot, a lot of opportunities and yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll find even more as we go on. So thank you, that's the end of this presentation, so. And you know, one of the things that's interesting there, Josh, as you close out your screen, uh, it's interesting, it's like to go into biologically sensitive areas. So when we think of planetary protection and those other things, uh, being able to send and fly the Ingenuity helicopter there where maybe we wouldn't allow a rover to go into, it could fly over uh, an extinct kind of uh, Martian riverbed where we couldn't you know, kind of feasibly do that with good conscience. Um, and everything. I, again, it's just an, a stunning, stunning thing. And we've got a few more questions if you are, for some reason, we cannot see you. Oh, yeah. Uh, my computer is sort of freezing while I was trying to stop. Uh... <laughs> uh, no worries. So How I think you just have to bear with me and at least you can hear me. So hopefully my computer will fix itself. <laughs> no worries. Um, so let me ask you this. It's like, uh, how many ingenuities were built? Is there, you know, counterpart used to troubleshoot with curiosity and perseverance? So there's one, I mean, there's one ingenuity, right? That's the, the name of the actual flight helicopter. But as far as other helicopters, which I don't think we've actually named any of them either, uh, there have been, uh, so there's the little, the little tiny one. There was the, the vehicle that was just the, um, the control, uh, you know, just the, the rotor with external controls. And then we built two engineering models. So the one, the one engineering model you saw fly was mostly the uh, test, um, you know, the flight test version. And 
Yeah, sorry. I don't know. My computer is uh, not happy. I don't want to push a button because I think it'll crash. Uh, yeah, no worries. Uh, yeah, and then the, the second was used for uh, environmental testing. Um, so that one went through, vi you know, vibration, uh, thermal testing, uh, you know, all the other. Oh, great. We might be back in business. Anyways. Um, so 11-year-old Ander, he wants to know what was the worst fail you had during testing? Uh, you know what? We got pretty lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think, or I can't really think of one. We certainly, you know, had a few, you know, mysteries and anomalies to solve throughout the, you know, the course of the project, but, you know, through the, through the campaign, you know, nothing broke. Uh, everything ultimately worked. Uh, we didn't really have to fix much, uh, yeah, it all kind of it all kind of went you know, pretty smoothly. So, sorry, I wish I had a more uh, fun answer for you, but you know <laughs> what? It makes us very very hopeful for what the future holds. Kendall <laughs> has a question: Has JPL thought about using object detection while flying over the Martian environment to identify features on the surface of Mars or in the environment? Uh, that's a little out of my uh, knowledge area. I'm not a visual navigation person, so uh, I. Don't know if I can answer that. Uh, our navigation camera, I do know, is able to pick up features as, as it navigates. So there might be some amount of that already built into this. Uh, you know, again, unfortunately, I'm not uh, uh, I'm not uh, really expert on that, so I'm not going to tell you something wrong. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Okai has a question. Says, how fast can Ingenuity relay messages back to Earth, or does the relay come back from Perseverance? Uh, yes, it comes through Perseverance. Uh, we talk to them. Uh, we don't have the power actually to speak directly to Earth. So we talk to, uh, there's a base station, a uh, little electronics box on the rover that's dedicated to be the interface to helicopter and that's controlled by the rover. And so we talk to the base station, it talks to the rover and you know, the rover takes that information and you know, uh, Perseverance sends it back to Earth. Fantastic. If you would indulge me this, I want everybody to see, and I'm going to pull this up before I do it. If you guys haven't watched uh, Veniza Rupani's um, essay where she, you know, gets the, gets the call from uh, the team and Mimi Ong telling her that her essay has garnered uh, the, the right to name or that they have chosen her essay submission as a uh, as the name for the new rover. It's just pretty darn great. So I'll play it now if you guys will indulge me this small thing. Ingenuity represents the most remarkable things that humanity is capable of. These achievements are not just the product of pure determination. They're a combination of human perseverance and ingenuity. Hi, Vanessa. My name is Mimi Ong. I work at uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, and my job there is a uh, project manager for Mars Helicopter. Mars Helicopter is a technology demonstration flight experiment that uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance uh, rover is hosting. And we're going for the attempt at flying the first ever flight on another planet. So uh, I've been really excited about this phone call to talk to you because I'm getting to share with you the news that your proposed name has been chosen as the name for Mars Helicopter. Well, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so on behalf of our entire Mars Helicopter team, I'd like to thank you for our name for our Mars Helicopter, Ingenuity. It's the perfect name for us. We really, we love the name, so thank you. Thank you, guys. Ingenuity is what allows people to accomplish amazing things, and it allows us to expand our horizons to the edges of the universe. Again, thank you for that indulgence. I just think it's so great. And the joy that uh, Mimi expresses there, she's getting a chance to tell Veniza the news that her essay name is what you guys chose. Because let's face it, then it would just be called the Mars Helicopter. I, we like the name. 
<laughs> as you as you so uh, so mentioned before. Uh, so this is going to give us a way to really soar instead of crawl on Mars. Yep. Uh, yeah. It's just uh, I'm not sure what else to say about it. It's just been a yeah a great experience, and I think it'll be amazing to see what it can see. Um, yeah, talking to Veniza for uh, uh, just, a, I think I talked possibly earlier with you about that. Yeah, we were lucky enough to get to call in with her too um, when the announcement was made. So I think that was when we all learned <laughs> the name too. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty uh, you know, wonderful experience for, for all the team. Oh, you know, I can only imagine. And again, uh, I've watched both her and Alex Mother, who named the Perseverance Rover. They seem so completely like, dumbstruck with the fact that they are getting the call that um, it is pretty profound. And for them to have a moment in time where they realize their voice matters in all of these exploration attempts. Uh, and again, we can't wish your team any better luck or success. We will look very forward to it, Perseverance Landing in February, and then set our eyes and mark our calendars for April or May of 2021 and keep our eyes on ingenuity and cross all our fingers. Any last things that um, you might want to share with everybody? And, and I'm going to go to Maybe before I ask that question, let me ask another one. What is your why? Why did you want to become a mechanical engineer? And what is your why to want to see this succeed? So I don't know. I just uh, always like building things. I always like space. It just uh, worked out um, for me. You know, uh, I, I guess I got lucky getting the job I did, right? I mean, at some point, it just comes down to, you know, roll of the the dice, but it's been so meaningful to me. Uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons people like space. Uh, you know, some people are into the science, some people are into the technology. Uh, for me, I, I really like the, I mean, I like those too, but I really like the exploration aspect. Yeah, I like being able to go somewhere that we haven't been before. I like being able to do something we haven't done before. You know, it's interesting, it's new, it's, you know, it's a kind of part of the human spirit, I guess. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, this is this mission is, is one of those things, right? I mean, get to getting to contribute to something that you know ha has never been done before uh, is just. I mean, it's hard to think of uh, something more meaningful. So, I mean, your name will go down in history with the success of this, alongside uh, the Wright brothers, the first aerial uh, flight on another planet uh pretty profound any last things you want to tell everybody before we close this afternoon uh just uh you know if uh anything's possible out there you know i don't want to be too pithy but uh, you know anything's possible you know work hard uh you know hopefully you know everyone had the opportunity to do something you know that's meaningful to them um just you know hopefully yeah root for us we're definitely uh you know waiting expectantly and uh rooting for it too um and we're just yeah super excited to see what happens you know come uh you know february for perseverance landing and then you know uh, april may for helicopter for ingenuity well it's what i love to tell everybody it's a grand time for mars hope probe will be arriving china's ton one will be there it'll be a party on mars in 2021 if we have any educators out there and you would like some great things on the jpl education website uh, you can get instructions and have your kids build their very own ingenuity helicopter there is also something very super cool yes these things are called rover view glasses. All you got to get is some of those uh, kind of like theater uh, 3D glasses. Uh, they've got some great things that after you decorate this and make it look like the Perseverance Rover, uh, some great 3D images uh, your student might really enjoy taking a look at. There is also the good old fashioned JPL has a paper uh, template for a helicopter on their website as well. Bravo not only to your engineering team and the entire team of ingenuity and perseverance and everyone who's worked on this incredible marvel but also if you need educational resources check out nasa next gen stem uh it will lead you all over the place and then uh to great kind of 
wonderful activities and instruction like these along with the JPL education site. So NASA Next Gen STEM, JPL education, uh, some great ways to continue this next generation and get everybody with their eyes and hearts focused on Mars. We thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, and if, uh, again, as we enter in to a grateful season, uh, maybe some of you guys are taking this next week to just have a bit of downtime. Josh, I hope that's true for you, but we are most grateful for your time and energy this afternoon. Uh, and again, for us, just something to hope and dream about and cheer for. Thank you so much. All right, you go and keep doing great work at JPL. And we are going to bid our uh, entire audience just a big and wonderful holiday. May we all breathe a little deeper and uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy whatever kind of grateful celebration you guys are planning. We are indeed most, uh, most amazed at the marvel of all of you who have come along this journey with us in the year that is 2020. So again, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts that uh, you've been here with Explore Mars. Thank you and have a great afternoon.